Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, a lot going on in the world. I think I will reserve comment for the time being. Maybe do an Ask Me Anything podcast fairly soon. Just one brief housekeeping point. Many of you have recently asked whether all supporters of this podcast through Patreon or through my website will get access to tickets for live events. The answer to that question is yes. doesn't matter whether you support through Patreon or my website. Many of you continue to ask which I prefer. Uh, there are trade-offs with each. If you're supporting through Patreon, you're supporting on a per-episode basis, which many of you prefer. That's why I'm using that platform. Uh, and through my website, you can support monthly or on a one-time basis. And I have your email address through either channel, and you'll be hearing from me when I post dates for my live events. The Waking Up Podcast was also just nominated for a Webby Award in the Science and Education category. Uh, that's kind of cool. Do these awards matter? I have no idea. But this seems like an opportunity to bring the podcast to the attention of people who would not otherwise know about it. So if you do want to take a moment to help accomplish that, you can vote. We're up against some fairly popular podcasts, one from NPR, The Hidden Brain, one from Gimlet Media, one from College Humor. Uh, these are the big leagues as far as podcasts are concerned. So if you do want to put your shoulder to the wheel here, take a moment and go to vote.webbyawards.com. And then in the podcast category and the science and education category under that, you will be able to vote. This is one of the many ways to support the show that does not entail any financial sacrifice on your end, just spreading the word. And the reviews you can leave on iTunes and elsewhere also help accomplish that. So many thanks for taking the time. And now for today's guest. Today I'm speaking with Tristan Harris. Tristan has been called by The Atlantic magazine the closest thing that Silicon Valley has to a conscience. He was a design ethicist at Google and then left the company to start a foundation called Time Well Spent, which is a movement whose purpose is to align technology with our deepest interests. Tristan was recently profiled on 60 Minutes. That happened last week. He's worked at various companies, Apple, Wikia, Apsure, and Google. And he graduated from Stanford with a degree in computer science, have been focused on human-computer interaction. We talk a lot about the ethics of human persuasion and about what information technology is doing to us and allowing us to do to ourselves. This is an area which I frankly haven't thought much about, so listening to Tristan was a bit of an education. Uh, but needless to say, this is an area that is not going away. We are all going to have to think much more about this in the years ahead. In any case, it was great to talk to Tristan. I have since discovered that I was mispronouncing his name. Apologies, Tristan. Sometimes having a person merely say his name in your presence proves insufficient. Such are the caprices of the human brain. But however you pronounce his name, Tristan has a lot of wisdom to share. And he's a very nice guy as well. So, meet Tristan Harris. I am here with Tristan Harris. Tristan, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. So, uh, we were set up by uh, some mutual friends. We have a few friends and, and acquaintances in common. And you are in town doing an interview for 60 Minutes. Yep. Right. So you're, I was actually, I, I confess, I was not aware of your work. I think I'd seen the Atlantic article that came out on you recently, mm -hmm. but I think I had only seen it. I, I don't think I had read it. But what you're doing is fascinating and incredibly timely, given our dependence on this technology. And, and I think this conversation we're going to have, I'm imagining it's going to be something like a, a field guide to what technology is doing to the human mind. <laughs> I think we'll talk about how we can decide to move intentionally in that space of possibilities in a way that's healthier for, for all of us. And this is obviously something you're focused on, but to bring everyone up to speed, because even I was not up to speed until just a few days ago, what 
is your background? And I've heard you're, you've had some very interesting job titles at Google, perhaps among other places. One was the resident product philosopher uh, and design ethicist at Google. So how did Tristan Harris get to be Tristan Harris and, and what are you doing now? Well, first, thanks, thanks for having me, really. Uh, it's it's honor to be here. I'm a big fan of this podcast. Um, so yeah, my role at Google, that was an interesting uh, name. Uh, so design ethicist and product philosopher, I was really interested in essentially when a small number of people in the tech industry you know, influence how a billion people think every day without even knowing it. How, if you think about your role as a designer, how do you ethically steer a billion people's thoughts, framings, cognitive frames, behavioral choices, basically the schedule of people's lives. Since so mm. much of what happens on a screen, uh, even though people feel as if they're making their own choices, will be determined by the design choices of the people at Apple and Google and Facebook. So we will talk, I'm sure, a lot more about that. I guess prior to that, when I was a kid, uh, I was a magician uh, very early, and so I was really interested in the limits of people's minds that they themselves don't see, because that's mm. what magic is all about, uh, that there really is a kind of um, band of attention or short-term memory or ways that people make meaning or causality that you can exploit as a magician. And that had me fascinated in, as, a, as a kid, and I did a few little magic shows. And then uh, flash forward when I was uh, at Stanford, I did computer science, but I also studied as part of a lab called the, uh, the Persuasive Technology Lab with BJ Fogg, mm -hmm. which basically taught engineering students how this, this kind of library of persuasive techniques and habit formation techniques in order to build more engaging products, basically different ways of um, taking advantage of people's cognitive biases so that people fill out email forms, so that people come back to the product, so that people register a form, so that they fill out their LinkedIn profile, so that they tag each other in photos. And I became aware um, when I was at Stanford doing all this that there was no conversation about the ethics of persuasion. Right. And just to ground how impactful that cohort was, in my year in that class in the Persuasive Technology Lab, the, my project partners in that class and very close friends of mine were the founders of Instagram. Uh, and, so, and, and many other alumni of that year in 2006 actually went on to join the executive ranks at many companies we know, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, when they were just getting started. And, uh, and again, never before in history have such a small number of people with this tool set uh, influenced how people think every day by explicitly using these persuasive techniques. And so at Google, I just got very interested in uh, how we do that. Yeah, and so you were studying computer science at Stanford? Originally computer science, uh, but I dabbled a ton in linguistics and actually symbolic systems. Yeah. Because you, oh, yeah. you was, were at Stanford eventually. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, that was a great major at Stanford. I, I was in the philosophy department. That, there was overlap between philosophy and computer science for yeah. symbolic systems. I think Reed Hoffman was one of the first symbolic systems majors at yeah. Stanford. Yeah. So yeah, so persuasion, is, is, the connection to magic is interesting. There's, there's an inordinate number of magicians and fans of magic in the skeptical community as mm -hmm. well, perhaps somewhat due to the influence of James Randi. But mm -hmm. I mean, magic is really the ultimate act of persuasion. You're persuading people of the impossible. Mm -hmm. So you see a significant overlap between the, the kinds of hacks of people's attention that magicians rely on and our new persuasive technology. Yeah, I think, well, I think if you just abstract away what persuasion is, it's the ability to do things to people's minds that they themselves won't even see how that process took place. And I think mm -hmm. that parallels your work uh, in a big way in that beliefs do things. To have a belief shapes the subsequent experience of what you have. I mean, in fact, in magic, there's like principles where you, know, you kind of want to start bending reality and creating these aha moments so that uh, you can do a little hypnosis trick later, for example, that people be more likely to believe having gone through a few things that have kind of bent the reality into being more superstitious or more open. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's just so many uh, ways of doing this that most people don't really recognize. I wrote an article called uh, How Technology Hijacks Your Mind that um, ended up going viral to about a million people, and it goes through a bunch of these different techniques. But uh, yeah, that's not something mm. people mostly think about. You also said in the setup for this interview that you have an interest in cults. Yeah. What's that about? And, and to what degree have you looked at cults? Um, well, I, I, I find cults fascinating because they're kind of like vertically integrated, persuasive environments instead mm -hmm. of 
just persuading someone's behavior or being the design of a, a supermarket or the design of um, you know a technology product you are designing the social relationships the power dynamic between a person standing in front of a of, a, of an audience mm -hmm. you you can control many more of the variables. And so uh, I've done a little bit of sort of undercover <laughs> investigation of some of these things. You mean actually joining a cult or? No, not joining, but... Uh, showing I mean, up ma physically and, and... Many, showing up physically, many of these things are, um, none of these cults ever would call themselves cults. I mean, many of them are simply workshops, sort of new mm -hmm. agey style workshops, but you start seeing these parallels in the dynamics. Do you want to name any names? Do I know these? Groups? I might prefer not to at the okay. moment. We'll see if we get there. Okay. <laughs> You have a former girlfriend who's still in one? Or? <laughs> no, no. But I, I did actually, one of the interesting things is the way that people that I met in those cults who eventually left and later talked about their experience and the confusion that you face, and I know this is an interest you've had, uh, the confusion that you face uh, when you've gotten many benefits from a cult. Uh, right. you've, you've actually deprogrammed, let's say, early childhood traumas or identities that you didn't know you were holding or different ways of, uh, of seeing reality that, that they helped you, you know, get away from. And you get these incredible benefits and you feel more free, but then you also realize that was all part of this larger persuasive game to get you to spend a lot of money on classes or courses or these kinds of things. Right. And so what the confusion that I think people experience in knowing that they got all these benefits, but then also felt manipulated and they don't know in the sort of mind's natural black and white thinking how to reconcile those two facts. I actually think there's mm. something parallel there with technology because, for example, in my previous work on this, a lot of people expect you, if you're criticizing how technology is designed, if you might say something like, oh, you're saying Facebook's bad, but look, I get all these benefits from Facebook. Look at all these great things it does for me. And it's because people's minds can't hold on to both the truth that uh, we do derive lots of value from Facebook and there's many manipulative design techniques uh, in, in across all these products that are not really on your team to help you live your life. Right. Um, and and that, that's, that distinction is very interesting when you start getting into what ethical persuasion is. Yeah, it is a bit of a paradox because you can get tremendous benefit from things that are either not well-intentioned or just objectively bad for you or, or not optimal. I mean, you know, the, the ultimate case is you, you hear from all of these people who you know, survived cancer, and cancer was the most important thing that ever happened to them. Right. So a train wreck can be good for you on some level, because your response to it can be good for you. Right. You can become stronger in all kinds of ways, even by being mistreated mm -hmm. by people. And so, but it seems to me that you can always argue that there's probably a better way right. to get those gains. Well, and this is, I mean, frankly, with your work on the moral landscape, you know, when, when you're thinking about, if you're a designer at Facebook or at, at Google, uh, because of how frequently people turn to their phone, you're essentially scheduling these little blocks of people's time. If you put, you know, if I, if I immediately notify you for um, every Snapchat message, which Snapchat is one of the most abusive, uh, more manipulative of, of the technology products, there, you know, when you see a message from a friend in that moment urgently, a lot that will cause a lot of people to go swipe over and, and not just see that message, but then get sucked into all the other stuff that they've been sort mm -hmm. of hiding for you, right? Uh, and that's all very deliberate. And so if you think of it as, let's say you're a designer at Google and you want to be ethical and you're steering people towards these different timelines, you're steering people towards schedule A in which these events will happen or schedule B in which these other events will happen. You know, back to your point, should I schedule something that you might find really challenging or difficult, but that later you'll feel is incredibly valuable? Uh, do I take into account the peak end effect where people mm -hmm. will have a peak of an experience and an end? Do I take a lot of their time or a little bit of their time? Should the goal be to minimize how much time people spend on the screen? Uh, what is the value of screen time? And what are people doing that's lasting and fulfilling? And when are you steering people as a designer towards choices that are more shallow or empty? So you're clearly concerned about time, as we all should be. It's, mm -hmm. it's the one non-renewable resource. It's the one, the one thing we can't possibly get back yep. any of, no matter what other resources we marshal. And it's clear that our technology, especially smartphone-based technology, is just a kind of bottomless sink of time and attention. I guess there's the other element that we, we're going to want to talk about, which is the consequence of bad information or superficial information and just what it's doing to yeah. our minds. I mean, the, the, the fake news phenomenon being of 
topical interest, but just the quality of what we're paying attention to is crucial. But the, the automaticity of this process, the addictiveness of this process, the fact that we're being hooked and we're not aware of, the, of how calculated this exactly. intrusion into our lives is. This is the thing that's missing is that people don't realize, because there's this, the most common narrative, I mean, we hear this all the time, that technology is neutral and it's just up to us to choose how we want to use it. And if mm. it happens, if people do fake news or if people start uh, wasting all their time, that that's just people's responsibility. What this misses is that because of the attention economy, uh, which is every basically business, whether it's a meditation app or the New York Times or uh, Facebook or Netflix or YouTube, you're all competing for attention. The way you win is by getting someone's attention and by getting it again tomorrow and by extending it for as long as possible. So it becomes this arms race for getting attention. And the best way to get attention is to know how people's minds work so that you can basically push some buttons and get them to not just come, but then to stay as long as possible. So there are design techniques uh, like making a, a product more like a slot machine uh, that has a variable schedule reward. So, you know, for example, I know you use Twitter. Mm. You know, when you land on Twitter, notice that there's that extra variable uh, time delay between like one and three seconds before that little number shows up. You have a return and the page loads. And there's this extra delay. I haven't noticed that. Yeah. You hold your breath. And then there's a little number that shows up for the notifications. Mm -hmm. And that delay is, is makes it like a slot machine. You're literally, when you load the page, you, you're as if you're pulling a lever and you're waiting and you don't know how many there's going to be. Is there going to be 500 because some big tweet storm or is there going to be Does, Doesn't one? it always say 99? Uh, well, you're, not everyone is Sam Harrison okay. has so many. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I mean isn't, isn't that always the maximum? It never says 500, right? Uh, you know, I, so I don't, because again, I'm not you. Yeah, I don't okay. have as many followers. No, I, well, um, I think I can attest that I mean, mine is always at 99, so it's no longer salient to me. Well, right, which actually speaks to how addictive variable rewards work, which is the point is it has to be a variable reward. Mm. So the idea that I push a lever or pull a lever and sometimes I get, you know, two and sometimes I get nothing and sometimes I get, you know, 20. And this is the same thing with email. Well, let's talk about what is the interest of the company, because I, I think most people are only dimly aware. I mean, they, they're certainly aware that these companies make money off of ads very often. They sell your data. So your, your attention is their resource. Yep. But take an example. I mean, so something like Twitter can't, seemingly can't figure out how to make money yet, but Facebook doesn't have that problem. Well, let's take the clearest case. Mm -hmm. What is Facebook's interest in you as a user? Well, obviously, the, there's, other, there's many sources of revenue, but it all comes down to, um, uh, whether it's data or everything else, it comes down to advertising and time. Because of the link that more of your attention or more of your time equals more money, uh, they have an infinite appetite in getting more of your time. So time on your newsfeed and this is, is literally is how what the they metrics, want. Yeah. That's right. And this is literally how the metrics and the dashboards look. I mean, they measure what is the current uh, sort of distribution of time on site. Time on site is the uh, that and seven day actives are the currency of the tech industry. And so right. the only other industry that measures users that way is sort of drug dealers, right? Where you have the number of active users who, lo who log in every single day. Um, so that combined with time on site are the, the key principal metrics. And the whole goal is to maximize time on site. So Netflix wants to maximize how much time you spend there. YouTube wants to maximize time on site. They recently celebrated people watching more than a billion hours uh, a month. And mm -hmm. that was a goal. And not because there's anyone who's evil or who uh, you know, wants to steal people's time, but because of the business model of advertising there is uh, simply no limit on how much attention that they would like from people. Well, they must be concerned about the rate at which you click through to their ads, or are they not? They can be concerned about that, but because, um, and ad rates are, are depreciating, but because they can make money just by simply showing you the thing, and there is some link between mm. showing it to you and you clicking, um, you can imagine with more and more targeted things that you are seeing things that, that are profitable. Uh, and there's always going to be someone willing to pay for that space. Uh, but this problem means that as this starts to saturate, because we only have so much time, to even hold on to your position in the attention economy, what do you do? You have to ratchet up how persuasive you are. So here's a concrete example. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're YouTube, uh, you need to add autoplay the next video right. to YouTube. Yeah. Didn't you see that within the last year? I always find that incredibly annoying. Yep. I wonder what percentage of people find that annoying. I mean, is it conceivable that that is still a good business decision for them, even if... 99% of people hate that feature? 
Well, it's it's with the whole exit voice or loyalty. If people don't find it so annoying that they're going to stop using YouTube, because the defense, of course, is yeah, there's no way they're going to stop using YouTube. So of course not. And yeah. that's what these these companies often hide behind this notion that if you don't like it, you can stop using the product. But while they're saying that, I mean, they have teams of thousands of engineers whose job is to deploy these techniques I learned at the Persuasive Technology Lab to get you to spend as much time as possible. Um, but just with that one example, let's say YouTube adds uh, autoplay the next video. So they just add that feature. And let's say that increases um, your average watch time on the site every day by 5%. So now they're eating up 5% more of this limited attention market share. Mm. So now Facebook's sitting there saying, well, shoot, we can't let this go, you know, to dry. So we've got to actually add autoplay videos to our newsfeed. So instead of waiting for you to scroll and then click play on the video, they automatically play the video. They didn't yeah. always used to do that. Yes, yeah, another feature I hate. Yep. And the reason, though, that they're doing that, what people miss about this is it's not by accident. The, the web and, and all of these tools will continue to evolve to be more engaging and to take more time because that is the business model. And so you mm -hmm. end up in this arms race for essentially who's a better magician, who's a better persuader, who knows these back doors in people's minds as a way of getting people to spend more time. Now, do you see this as intrinsically linked to the advertising model of revenue, or would this also be a problem if it was a subscription model? It's a, it's a problem in both cases, but advertising exacerbates the problem. So you're actually right that, um, for example, Netflix also maximizes uh, time on site. Uh, what I heard from someone through some back channels was that uh, the reason they have to do this is they found that if they don't maximize, because for example, they have this auto countdown watching mm -hmm. the next episode, right? right? So they yeah. don't have to do that. Why are yeah. they doing that? Strangely, I like that feature. Yeah. Try to figure that out psychologists among you. Well, and this is, this is where it gets down to what is ethical persuasion, because let's, that's a one persuasive transaction where they are persuading you mm. to watch the next video. Yeah. But in that case, you're happy about it. I guess the reason why I'm happy about it there is that it is at least nine times out of 10, it is by definition something I want to watch because it's in the same series as the series I'm already watching, right? Whereas YouTube is showing me just some random thing yep. that they think is analogous to the thing I just watched. And then when you're talking about Facebook, or I guess I've seen this feature on on embeds in news stories like on in the atlantic or vanity fair the moment you bring the video into the frame of the browser it'll start playing mm -hmm. i just find that annoying especially if, if your goal is to read the text rather than watch the video yep but again there's this because of the game theory of it when one news website evolves that strategy you can think of these as kind of organisms that are mutating new persuasive strategies that either work or not at holding on to people's attention and so you have some neutral playing field and one guy mutates this strategy of on the news website of auto-playing that video when you land. Let's say it's CNN. So now the other news websites, if they want to compete with that, they have to, and assuming that CNN has enough market share that that, that makes a, a difference, the other ones have to start trending in that direction. And this is why the internet has, has moved from being this neutral feeling resource where you're kind of just accessing things to feeling like there's this gravitational wormhole suck kind mm -hmm. of quality that pulls you in. And this is what I think is so important. You asked, you know, how much of this is due to advertising and how much of it is due to the hyper competition for attention um it, it's it's both uh one is we have to be able to decouple the link between how much attention uh we get from you and how much money we make and we actually did the same thing with um you know for example in uh, in energy markets where it used to be the energy companies made more money the more energy you use mm -hmm. and so therefore they have an incentive they want you to please leave the lights on please leave the faucet on we are happy we're making so much more money that way but of course, that was a perverse incentive. And so this new uh, regulatory uh, commission got established that, that um, basically decoupled, it was called decoupling, it decoupled the link between how much, how much energy you use and how much energy they, how much money they make. Well, and there's some ads online, that I can't even figure out how they're working or why they're there. They're, they're these horrible ads at the bottom of even the most reputable websites, like the Atlantic, you'll have these ads I think usually they're framed with, you know, from around the web, mm. and it'll be an ad like, you won't believe what these child celebrities That's, look like today. Yep. Uh, yeah, Taboola and Outbrain, there's a whole actual kind of market of companies that specifically provide these related links at the bottom of news websites. But that, I mean, they're so tawdry and awful. I mean, so you can go from just, you know, reading literally the best long form journalism and hit just one garish ad after another. But the, the thing that mystifies me is when you click through to these things, I can't see 
that it ever lands at a product that anyone who was reading that article would conceivably buy. I mean, you're just going down the sinkhole into yep. something horrible. Everything looks like a scam. It's just it all comes down to money, though. The reason why, so I actually know a lot about this because the company, the way I arrived at Google was they bought our little uh, startup company for our talent. And we didn't do what this, this sort of market of websites did, mm -hmm. but we were almost being pushed by publishers who used our technology to do that. Uh, so one of the reasons I'm so sensitive to this time on site stuff is because I had a little company called Apture, which provided uh, little in-depth background pieces of information without making you leave news websites. So you'd be on The Economist and it would talk about uh, Sam Harris and you'd say, who's Sam Harris? You'd highlight it and we'd give you sort of a multimedia background or thing and you could interactively explore and go deeper. And the reason we sold this, the reason why Economist wanted it on their website is because it increased time on site. And so I was left in this dilemma where the thing that I got up to do in the morning as a founder was, let's try to help people understand things and learn about things. But then the actual metric was, is this increasing our time on site or not? And publishers would push us to either increase revenue or increase time on site. And so the reason that The Economist and all these other even reputable websites have these bucket of links at the bottom is because they actually make more money from Taboola and Outbrain and a few others. Now, time on site seems somewhat insidious as a standard, except if you imagine that the content is intrinsically good. Now, now I'm someone who's slowly but surely building a meditation app, right? Mm -hmm. So now right. time on my app will be time spent practicing meditation. And so insofar as I think that's an intrinsically good thing for someone to be doing, yep. anything I do in the design of the app so as to make that more attractive to do, and, and in the best case, mm -hmm. irresistible to do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is, I would like an app in my life that got me to do something that is occasionally hard to do, but I know is worth doing and, and good for me to do, right? rather than waste my time on Twitter. Something like meditation, something like exercise, eating more wisely, I don't know how that mm -hmm. can be measured in terms of time, but th there are certain kinds of manipulations speaking personally, of, of my mind that I would happily sign up for, right? right? So how do you think about that? Absolutely. So that this is a great example. So because of the attention economy constantly ratcheting up these persuasive tricks, um, the price of entry for, say, a new meditation app is you're going to have to try and find a way to sweeten that front door so that that, is, that competes with the other front doors that are on someone's screen at the moment when they wake up in the morning. And of course, you know, as much as I you know, and I think many of us don't like to do this. It's like the Twitter and the Facebook and the email ones are just so compelling first thing in the morning, even if that's not what we'd like to be doing. And so it, because all of these different apps are neutrally competing on the same playing field for morning attention and not a specific kind of like helping Sam wake up best in the morning, uh, for your meditation app and what many meditation apps I personally know, they, they have to provide these usually these notifications. So they start mm -hmm. realizing, oh, shoot, Facebook and Twitter are notifying people first thing in the morning to get their attention. So if we're going to stand a chance to get in the game, we have to start notifying people. Right. And then everyone starts, again, amping up in the arms race, and you don't end up with, it's this race, classic race to the bottom. Uh, you don't end up with a, you know, a screen you want to wake up to in the morning at all. It's not good for anybody. But it all became, came from this, um, uh, this need to basically get there first, to race up. And so wouldn't we want to change the, you know, the structure of what you're competing for so it's not just attention at all cost? So yeah, so you have called for what well, I think you've called a, a Hippocratic Oath for software designers. You know, first, do no harm. What do you think designers should be doing differently now? Well, I think of it less as the Hippocratic Oath. That's the thing that got captured in the Atlantic article. But a, a different way to think about it is that the attention economy is like this city. You know, essentially Apple and Google and Facebook are the urban planners of this city that a billion people live inside of. And um, we all live inside of it, like all, a billion people live inside of this attention city. And in that city, it's designed entirely for commerce. It's maximizing basically attention at all costs. And that was fine when we first got started. But now, um, this is a city that people live inside of. I mean, the amount of time people spend on their phone, they wake up with them, they go to sleep with them, they check them 150 times a day. That's actually a real figure too, right? 150 yeah. times a day is a real figure for yeah. sure. Yeah. And... So now what we'd, what we'd want to do is organize that city, almost like uh, you know, Jane Jacobs created this sort of live, livable cities movement, 
and said, you know, there, there are things that make a great city great. There are things that make a city livable. Uh, you know, she pointed out eyes on the street, you know, stoops in New York. Uh, she was talking about Greenwich Village. These are things that make a neighborhood feel different, feel more homey, livable, safe. Uh, these are values people have about what makes a good urban planned city. There is no set of values to design this city for attention. So far, it's been this Wild West, let each app compete on the same playing field to get attention at all costs. So when you ask me, what, would, what should app designers do? I'm saying it's actually a deeper thing. That's like saying, what should the casinos who are all building stuff in the city do differently? Right. If a casino is there and the only way for it to even be there is to do all the same manipulative stuff that the other casinos are doing, it's going to go out of business if it doesn't do that. So the better question to ask is, how would we reorganize the city by talking to the urban planners, by talking to Apple, Google, and Facebook to change the basic design? So let's say there are zones. And one of the zones in the attention economy city would be the morning habits zone. Mm. So now you just get things competing for what's the best way to help people wake up in the morning, which could also include the phone being off, right? That could be mm. part of how the phone the option of the phone being off for a period of time and telling your friends that you're not up until 10 in the morning or whatever could be one of the things competing for the morning part of your life in the life zone there. Uh, and th that would be a better strategy than trying to change, you know, meditation app designers to take a Hippocratic oath to be more responsible when the whole game is just not set up for them to succeed. Well, to come back to that question, because it, it's of personal interest to me, because I, I do want to design this app in a way that seems ethically impeccable. Mm -hmm. If the thing you're directing people to is something that you think is intrinsically good, and I mean, forget about all the competition for mind share that yep. exists that you spoke about, it's just hard to do anyway. I mean, people are reluctant to do it. That's why right. I think an app would be valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think the existing apps are valuable. So if you think that any time on app is time well spent, which I don't think Facebook can say, and I don't think Twitter can say, but I think Headspace can say that. Mm -hmm. You know, wh whether or not that's true, you know, someone else can decide. But I think without any sense of personal hypocrisy, I think they feel that if you're using their app more, that's good for you, mm -hmm. right? Because they think that it's intrinsically good to meditate. And I'm sure any exercise app, you know, or the health app or whatever it is, I'm sure that they all feel the same way about that. And they're, they're probably right. Take that case and then let's move on to a case where everyone's motives are, are more mercenary and where time on the app means more money for the, the company, which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the case for some other apps. When time on the app is intrinsically good, why not try to get people's attention any way you can? Right. Well, so this is where the question of metrics is really important because um, in an ideal world, the thing that each app would be measuring would align with the thing that each person using the app actually wants. So time well spent would mean, in the case of meditation app, asking the user, I mean, just not saying the app would do this, but if you were to think about it, a user would say, okay, in my life, what would be time well spent for me in the morning waking up? And then imagine that whatever the answer to that question is should be the rankings in the app store, rewarding the apps that are best at that. Um, so that, again, is more the, the, the systemic answer that the systems like the app stores and the uh, ranking functions that, that run, say, Search, Google Search, or Facebook Newsfeed would want to sort things by what helps people the most, not what's got the most uh, time. And the measure of that would be the evaluation of the user? I mean, the, 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 some questionnaire-based rating? Like, yeah. Is this working for you? Uh, yeah. And in fact, we've, we've done some initial work with this. Actually, there's an app called Moment on iOS. So Moment uh, tracks uh, how much time you spend in different apps. Uh, you send it a screenshot of your battery page on the iPhone, and it just captures all that data. And we've mm. actually, they partnered with uh, Time Well Spent to ask people which apps do you find are most time well spent, you're most happy about the time you spent when you can finally see this is all the time you spent in it, and which apps do you mm -hmm. most regret. And we have the data back that people regret the time that they spend in Facebook, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and WeChat the most. Mm -hmm. And they tend, to, so far the current rankings uh, are, for the most, are like My Fitness Pal and podcasts, and there's a bunch of other ones that I forgot. The irony is that being ranked first in regret is 
probably as accurate a measure as any of the success of your app. Yeah, exactly. Well, and this is why the economy isn't ranking things or aligning things with what we actually want. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it as everything is a choice architecture and you're sitting there as a human being worth picking from a menu and currently the menu sorts things by what gets the most downloads, the most sales, the most gets most talked about, mm. the things that most manipulate your mind. So the whole economy has become this, if you assume marketing is as persuasive as it is in a bigger level, the economy reflects what's best at manipulating people's psychology, not what's actually best in terms of delivered benefits in people's lives. And so if you think about this as, as a deeper systemic thing about if you would want, how would you want the economy to work? Um, you'd, you'd want it to rank things so that the easiest thing to reach for would be the things that people found to be most time well spent in their lives would it, for whatever category of life choice that they're making at that moment in terms of making choices right. easier or hard because you can't escape, you know, in every single moment there is a, a menu and some choices are easy to make and some choices are hard to make. It seems to me you run into a problem which behavioral economists know quite well and this is something that Danny Kahneman has spoken a lot about that there's a difference between the experience in self moment to moment and the remembered self. So when you're giving someone a questionnaire, asking them whether their time on all these apps and websites was well spent, you are talking to, to the, the remembered self. self. And Danny and I once argued about this, how to reconcile the, these two different testimonies. But at minimum, you can say that they're reliably different. So that if you, you were experienced sampling people along the way, you know, for every 100 minutes on Facebook, yep. every 10 minutes you were saying, how happy are you right now? You would get one measure if at the end of the day you asked them how good a use of your time was that to be on Facebook for 100 minutes, you would get a different measure. Yep. Sometimes they're the same, but they're very often different. And the question is who to trust? Where are the data that you're going to use to assess whether people are spending their time well? Well, I mean, the problem right now is that the, all of the metrics just relate to the current present self version, right? Um, everything is only measuring what gets most clicked or mm. what gets most shared. So back to fake news, just because something is shared the most doesn't mean it's the most true. Just because something gets clicked the most doesn't mean it's the best. Just because something is talked about the most doesn't mean that it's real or true, right? right. The second that Facebook took away its human editorial team for the Facebook trends. Yeah. Um, and the, and they, they fired that whole team. And so it's just an AI picking what the most popular news stories are. Within 24 hours, it was gamed and the top story was a false story about Megyn Kelly and Fox News. And so right now, if getting into AI about all of these topics, um, AIs essentially have a pair of eyes or, or sensors that are trying to pick from these impulsive or, or immediate signals and it doesn't have a way of being in the loop or in conversation with our more reflective selves. It can only talk to our present in the moment selves. And so you can imagine some kind of weird dystopian future where the entire world is only listening to your present in the moment feelings and thoughts, which are easily gameable by mm. persuasion. Although it just is a question how to reconcile the difference between being pleasantly engaged moment by moment in a activity at the end of which you will say, I kind of regret spending my time that way. There are certain things that are captivating where you, you're hooked for a reason, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's a video game or whether you're eating French fries or popcorn or something that is just perfectly salted so that you just can't stop, you're binging on something because in that moment it feels good. And then retrospectively, very often you regret that use of time. Well, so one frame of this is this sort of shallow versus deep sense. That's what you're getting at here is yeah. a sense of something can either be full but empty, which we don't have really words in the English language for this, or something can be full and fulfilling. Things can be full very, very yeah. engaging or pleasurable, but not fulfilling. Yeah. Yes. And even more specifically regretted. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the set of choices that you can make for a timeline. If you're, again, scheduling someone else's life for them, as people at Google and Facebook do every day, you know, where the, you can schedule a choice that is full and fulfilling. Now, does that mean that we should never put choices on the menu that are full, but you regret? Like, should we never do that for mm. Google or for Facebook? That's one frame, but let me actually flip it around and make it I think, even more philosophically interesting. Let's say that in the future, YouTube is even better at knowing exactly what at every bone in your body you've been meaning to watch, like the professor or lecture that you've been told was like the 
best lecture in the world, or just think about what every bone in your body tells you, in fact, would be full and fulfilling for you. And let's imagine this future DeepMind-powered version of YouTube is actually putting those perfect choices next on the menu. So now it's auto-playing the perfect next thing that is also full and fulfilling. Right. There's still something about the way the screen is steering your choices that are not about being in alignment with the life you want to live because it's not in alignment with the time dimension now. So now it's sort of blowing open or blowing past boundaries. You have to bring your own boundaries. Right. You have to resist the perfect. You have to resist the perfect. Yeah. Now, should that be... And but by the way, because of this arms race, that is where we're trend, trending to. People don't understand this. The whole point of attention, the attention economy, because of this need to maximize attention, that's where YouTube will be in the future. And so wouldn't you instead say, I want Netflix's goal to basically optimize for whatever is time well spent for me, which might be, let's say for me, watching one really good movie a week that I've been really meaning to watch. And that's because I'm defining that. It's in conversation with me about what I reflectively mm. would say is time well spent. And it's not trying to just say you should maximize as much as possible. And for that relationship to work, the economy would have to be an economy of loyal relationships, meaning I would have to recognize as a consumer that even though I only watch you know, one movie a week, that's enough to justify my relationship with Netflix. Because they found in this case that uh, if they don't maximize time on site, people actually end up canceling their subscription over time. And so that's why they're, they're still trapped in the same right. race. Right. And what concerns you most in this space? Is it social media more than anything else? Or is everything that's grabbing attention engaged in the same arms race and, and kind of of equal concern to you? Well, what, you know, it's, as a systems person, it's, it's really the system. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the attention economy. It's the race for attention itself that concerns me. Because one is people are, in the tech industry, appear to me very often... Uh, as being blind to what that race costs us. You know, if, if one, let's, I mean, for example, the fake news stuff, let, instead of going to fake news, let's call it fake sensationalism. You know, the news feed is trying to figure out what people click the most. And if one news site evolves the strategy of outrage, outrage is a way better persuasive strategy at getting you to click mm -hmm. if it generates outrage. Right. And so the news feed, without even having any person at the top of it, any captain of the ship, saying, oh, I know what's going to be really good for people is outrage, or that'll get us more attention. It just discovers this as an invisible trait that starts showing up in the AI. So it starts steering people towards news stories that generate outrage. And that's literally where like, the news feeds have gone in the yeah, last where we are. three months. This is yeah. where we are. True or fake, it's an right. outrage machine. Yeah. And, and then the question is, how much is that outrage? I mean, there's, if you thought about it, in the world... Is there any lack of things that would generate outrage? I mean, there's an infinite supply yeah. of news today, and yeah. there was even 10 years ago, that would generate outrage. Right. And if we had the perfect AI 10 years ago, we could have also delivered you a, a day full of outrage. And so... Uh, that's a funny title. <laughs> a day Just, full of outrage. Yeah, how easy to, would that be to market? A day full of outrage. <laughs> Nobody thinks they want that, but we're all acting like that's exactly what we want. Well, and I think this is where the language gets interesting, because when we talk about what we want, we, we talk about what we click. But in the moment, right before you click, I mean, I'm kind of a meditator too. Mm -hmm. It's like, I notice that what's going on for me right before I click is not, as you know from free will, like, how much is that a conscious choice? What's really going on phenomenologically in that moment right before the click? None of your conscious choices are conscious choices. Right. You're the last to know why you're doing the thing you're about to do, and you're very often misinformed about it. We can set up experiments where you will reliably do the thing for reasons that you, when you're forced to articulate them, are completely wrong about. Absolutely. And even moreover, people, again, when they're about to click on something, don't realize there's a thousand people on the other side of the screen whose job it was, was to get you to click on that. Because yeah. that's what Facebook and Snapchat and YouTube are all for. So it's not even a neutral moment. Do you think that fact alone would change people's behavior if you could make that transparent? It just seems it would be instructive for most people to see the full stream of causes that engineered mm -hmm. that moment for them. Well, one thing, I've got some friends in San Francisco who are talking about this, that uh, people don't realize, and especially when you start applying some kind of normativity and saying, you know, the news feed's really not good, we need to rank it a different way. And they say, whoa, 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 who are you to say what's good for people? And 
I always say this is status quo bias. People are thinking that somehow the current thing we have is set up to be best for people. It's not. Yes. It's best for engagement. If you were to give it a name, if Google has page rank, Facebook is engagement rank. Now let's just, let's say let's take it all the way to, all the way to the end. Let's say you could switch modes as a user, and you could actually switch Facebook to uh, addiction rank. The, fa the Facebook actually has a version of newsfeed that I'm sure it could deploy called, you know, let's just actually tweak the the variables so that whatever uh, let's show people the things that will addict them the most. Or we have outrage rank, which will show you the things that will outrage you the most. Mm -hmm. Or we have NPR rank, which actually shows you the most boring, long comment threads where you have like these, you know, long, in-depth conversations that your, your whole newsfeed is these long, deep, threaded conversations. Mm -hmm. Or you could have the Bill O'Reilly mode where you get these, as I, something I know you care about, these sort of attack dog style comment threads where people are yelling at each other. You can imagine yeah. that the newsfeed could be ranked in any one of these ways. Actually, there's this form of of choice is already implemented on Flickr, where you, when you look for images, you can choose relevant or interesting, or yep. so you could have that same drop down menu for any of these other media. And this is this is your point of like people don't see transparently what the goals of the designers who put that choice in front of you are. Right. So. The first thing would be to reveal that there is a goal. It's not a neutral product. It's not just something for you to use. You can obviously, with enough effort, get you know use Facebook for all sorts of things. But the point is the default sort of compass or or north star on the GPS that is Facebook of steering your life is not steering your life towards, hey, help me have the dinner party you know that I want right. to have, or help me uh, get together with my friends uh, on Tuesday, or help me make sure I'm not feeling lonely uh, on a, on a Tuesday night. There is. It seems to me a necessary kind of paternalism here that we just have to accept because it seems true that we were living in a world where no one or virtually no one would consciously choose the outrage tab. Right. Right. Like uh, basically, I want to be as outraged as possible today. <laughs> Show me everything in my newsfeed that's going to piss me off. Nor the addiction tab. Yeah. Nor the superficial uses of attention tab. You know, just cat videos. Yeah. All or day it's long. just give me the Kardashians all day long and. I'll regret it later. So no one would choose that, and yet we are effectively choosing that by virtue of what proves to be clickable in the attention economy. In service of the greater goal of advertising, again, like right. that goal wasn't by accident. In fact, in some ways it, it was, because I think sometimes what's so interesting when you talk to the people who make the products, of course there's no one there who says, I want to take you or steer you away from the life choices that you want to make. No one thinks that way. Um, the narrative, of course, at Facebook is that we're helping make the world more open and connected. And of course, it's hard to argue with that because it does do that, too. The problem is that's not what the thing that they're measuring every day is. Right. And also, what would that mean? What would be the values or the measurable outcomes or the teleological frames that you'd be choosing for? I mean, instead, imagine a time well spent rank, which would be basically a life rank. Like, what do you want most in your life? And instead of having those thousand engineers working to get me to scroll or click on the next thing, uh, those thousand engineers would be basically working to help me schedule the next moments of my time in ways that I would find take me closer to the life that I want to live. Mm -hmm. You keep using this phrase, time well spent. That is a both a website and a, a foundation you started? or Yeah, so it's a uh, nonprofit movement um, that uh, I, when I left Google and my work as the design ethicist there, um, I realized that there was this fundamental conflict of interest, that the attention economies maximization of time spent was just never going to go away. And so if you want to change that, that core currency of success, you have to go outside. It's kind of like what the organic food movement was, right? Where before organic food, it was just uh, a race to the bottom to provide the cheapest lettuce on the shelf. And it's whoever can put the cheapest lettuce. Mm -hmm. And then someone figures out we can put cheap lettuce on there. We can get even cheaper lettuce by using this pesticide. And no one's discovered the pesticide yet. So that farmer starts to win. And it isn't until we have this new standard or this sort of movement that says we, we want organic food. We want a different kind of lettuce. Yeah. Um, so you need that or something like that, some kind of intervention like that to gradually change the success metrics. And so we call that time well spent just because it encapsulates the distinction between time spent today. So to, to use that analogy, the differentiator there is a person's willingness to pay for something that's harder to grow, harder to provide. Mm -hmm. So they're willing to pay more than what you have to pay for the cheapest possible lettuce. Right. What differentiates time stolen or squandered from time well spent in the marketplace? 
just imagine five years from now, we have solved all of these problems. Mm -hmm. Our technology is as good for us as possible. Yeah, good question. How did we get there? What have we changed? So what it would take is, there's different questions about how you'd get there, whether it's regulation or it's enlightened uh, founders of big technology companies choosing to rank suddenly everything differently. But you can imagine a world where Apple and Google recognize that the current designs invisibly of the smartphones are to maximize, let's say, the time people spend in all the apps. And that instead of maximizing for that, and instead of just wanting every app developer to be successful at all costs, they say, we are going to uh, reorganize home screens and notifications and app stores to rank success in terms of how time well spent people found these things to be for that part of their life. So news media is ranked on uh, the, whatever you would call it, the epistemological credibility or the uh, you know, truth seeking, or I mean, that, again, there's a bunch of different values that would be in that category. Morning habits and meditation apps would be ranked by uh, whatever people find helps them wake up best in the morning. Um, things would be ranked by the thing that matters for that category. Although it seems to me you're asking a lot of people to keep telling you whether things are working for them. Because yeah. with a click, they've told you without taking any time to tell you. They're not aware of having answered a questionnaire, but the way they're using their attention is giving everyone the information of you know whether this stuff is hookable in the way that the status quo now demands. In your world, we need people to assess the effects of their uses of attention and report back. But what are you actually picturing? How, how do people give the information back to the system so that these rankings reflect time well spent? So here's a concrete example. So let's imagine in the future, and I totally hear this concern, by the way, that do you want a world where everything is constantly asking you for a rating every single day mm. uh, for all of these things? Uh, and the answer is no, obviously. The question would be, from a time well spent angle, that time is the finite resource to manage. What amount of ratings would we want from people? But let's make it concrete. So let's say your phone, uh, you know, once a week basically shows you this reflection uh, of the biggest sort of surface areas of your phone's footprint in your life. So let's show, let's say that it shows you this mirror of saying, hey, Sam, this is how I see you waking up in the morning. Here's what a morning for you looks like. I have the data. <laughs> it's right here on the phone. Yeah. Um, it's stored locally, not in the server. <laughs> and, uh, and it says, hey, look, you know, I noticed that you wake up, you usually spend about 20 minutes uh, surfing Twitter. Uh, you're in your email for about 15 minutes. And then you get stuck in the Apple News app for about 30 minutes. And so you've got about an hour and 15 minutes before you're kind of Whatever, yeah. doing the and we thing. notice you haven't moved from we, your supine position. You haven't moved. Yeah. Let's even call it the uh, the sort of like uh, bed zone yeah. part of the reflection. <laughs> yeah. You haven't even gotten up. Um, which, by the way, again, back to persuasion. If if you could persuade someone just to lie down while they're doing all this stuff, you've actually are inherently changed the choice architecture. They're more likely to stay in the inertia of lying down than if you had stood them up, like just we know from designing right. physical space. Okay, so we have this moment where where we we see. Um, you know, your reflection that you've got this hour and 15 minutes that approximately is split between these different apps. And the phone says, is that what's time well spent for you in the morning? Like, what would be time well spent for you? And you would say, actually, not these things at all. And say, great, what would, what would it look like instead? And you'd say, hey, I want to meditate with my, my friends two, two days a week. And it says, great, who else meditates? And, and it would be directly linked into your app. And it'd basically say, when you and this other person wake up in the morning around the same time, do you want to opt into some kind of mode? So when you wake up, it shows you that if they also woke up around that time and you could swipe over and, you know, you're in a meditation experience with mm -hmm. them. And so now your meditation app wins on the basis of how well it actually helps people in that morning, not how well it can just hijack and throw a notification in or create the bottomless bowl or do these other kind of persuasive techniques. Right. And so that's an example where the phone is asking you for reflection at an infrequent enough basis that it doesn't feel taxing. Let's say it's once a, once a month even. And then it reorganizes the choice architecture of the home screen to be uh, most aligned with empowering you to make those choices. But again, now you're talking at the level of the city. This is not what any one app does. This Correct. is what Apple this does. This is what Apple and Google. And this is why, yeah. frankly, you, you need Apple and Google to make these changes. Or anyone who makes the platform, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality or an ear, earpiece, there, in general, there's going to be these choice architectures that we need those mm -hmm. platform makers, the urban planners, to be, to be thinking about it this way. Yeah, I want to talk about virtual reality and other technology, but to get my bearings here, 
do you think mostly in terms of mobile or is the, is the web just as much? Mm, I, I'm concerned with both because just the total time people spend on a screen every day is enormous and it obviously takes place increasingly on mobile. The thing about mobile is it's just the most ubiquitous. So it's the thing that affects everyone, no matter what sort of socioeconomic background you have. Do you know how the time is split between mobile and the web? I don't off the top of my head, but, huh. um, you know, obviously there's, there's people, knowledge workers who spend a third of their day in email at a desktop, and there's, there's this wide range. I, the question is just, you know, for each one of these core screens, how well is the choice architecture aligned with what people want? So now, what do you think is coming? What do you think virtual reality will do to us? And do we get new concerns there or just the same concerns, but more pressing? How well, one interesting thing about virtual reality is uh, if you were to rate a medium in terms of how persuasive it is. Um, so there's sort of a upper bound on how persuasive your mobile phone is, mm. right? It can't convince you of a new belief system, uh, right? Uh, but actually virtual reality can. Um, it's been shown that you know, in, in, in looking at this whole problem through a lens of persuasive technology, you're always concerned with what are the dimensions of persuasion? Can I just persuade people's beliefs? Can I persuade people's attitudes? Can I persuade people's identity to think of themselves differently? Uh, and one thing that's been shown, uh, this guy Jeremy Balinson at Stanford um, has done a bunch of experiments on this, that uh, you can have someone in virtual reality cut down a tree uh, and to feel like the haptic feedback of this thing jogging in your hands back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually changes your uh, relationship to uh, paper, like to basically wasting paper. Um, you can do some other things where people are embodied as like a, their opposite gender. And they experience something like, a, not sexual assault, but some kind of, or an opposite race or opposite ethnic background. And they experience some kind of embodied feeling or experience of, of someone looking at them a certain way in, in that mode. And it changes their feelings about what those policy issues might be later mm -hmm. in the world. And so VR is really interesting because it's the most persuasive medium uh, that, we, that we have. And the problem, though, is that people tend to think about you know, the future of technology as this being kind of an uncertain thing, that we don't know what's going to happen. It's like a grassy field. And it's, it's not that because the attention economy will still create this race for who's better at seducing your attention and keeping your attention and holding on to it, which means that things that are more like porn or more like the candy crushes of the VR realm will probably outcompete other things in that mm -hmm. realm. And the other stuff will exist, but it'll be niche. And so what I would say is, like, this is the opportunity now before those things come to be, say, you know, if we had a different philosophical lens on what uh, uh, rankings we would want the virtual reality app store to have, we'd want to rank things in terms of uh, what persuades people in a positive way or what is time well spent for them. It's interesting because it, on some level, what we're talking about isn't new at all. I mean, we're, people were wasting time 2,000 years ago, presumably, when you look at how the, you know, the people like the Buddha talked about the use of a human life and uh, the obstacles, in this case, to practicing meditation enough so as to have a good experience doing it, or to, you know, the, the obstacles to becoming a truly ethical person. It was the same dynamic of doing things that you will later regret, doing things that you will discover were not as gratifying as they seemed, and they were never going to be as gratifying as they seemed. And if you could have had a, a wiser view, a top-level view of the situation, you would have agreed to cancel some of those opportunities to squander your time in advance, right. because however captivating they are, it is just more soft drinks or candy or porn. But then I or, push back and say, so yeah. Sam, you're running Google. Who are you to say that what the things we should put on the menu are and what stuff we should leave out? Because well, we have to put some default choices on the menu. For right, people. right. Yeah, so, but, so it's this ancient problem, except what we have now are technologies that can not only exploit our bugs to the, if not the maximal degree, to certainly to a new degree where we can be manipulated by others to waste our time, but we can actually design technologies that will change not only what we wind up doing, but what we want to do. Yep. The fundamental question is, like, what, what sort of person do you want to be? And yep. what sort of life do you want to live? And what's, what sort of life will you want to have lived? When you're on your deathbed, looking back, how much regret will you have? We know the answer to this question. How much regret do you want to have? Everyone's answer is none, right? Right or as little as possible. And they won't change the fact that they'll go for the donut or, you know, go for the exhilarating experience. Cass Sunstein has a great line about this, that, you know, just because 
there are these things people regret later doesn't mean life should be, in his words, long, dry, and chocolate-free. Right. You know, yeah. that there is a value. Some of our peak experiences in life are these sort of um, impulsive moments, but there is a question of boundedness or frequency. Like, do you want that all the time? Do you want the default choices to always be set that way? You really get this raising kids because you, you're constantly in the position as a parent of doling out empty pleasures or even unhealthy pleasures to your kids, you know, as sparingly as is commensurate with your philosophy on these things. So whatever it is, ice cream. Do you have ice cream every day? No, right? But ice cream is a treat and it's fun and you don't want to live a life without ice cream, as far as I can tell. So you're, in, in a conservative way, exploiting your child's really bottomless capacity for joy around certain things which shouldn't, in the end, be the focus of life. You don't want a kid that, when he or she becomes an adult, has no way to console herself or himself but to go for a tub of ice cream. You don't want to figure out how to engineer that problem for them, but you still want a life with ice cream. And everything is like that on some level. And the problem is the new ice cream could be just the, the number of likes that someone has. I mean, I, I can convince as so many teenagers are, they've been convinced that their self-worth or their popularity yeah. is the number of likes that they have. Yeah, or Mo Minecraft. I mean, I have an eight-year-old daughter mm. who's now obsessed with Minecraft, and I can't even figure out whether Minecraft is good, neutral, or bad for her. People with strong opinions on that, tell me wh what you think about Minecraft. It's captivating to a degree that worries me, right? It's like, if I said, listen, you know what, you can just do as much Minecraft as you want, she would just disappear into right. virtual space and never come out again. Does she use Snapchat? Or no, no that, okay. nothing, nothing, nothing like, like that, that yet. Yeah. Yeah. We will be late adopters of all of that. But yeah, I can see that, yeah, the social aspect to this and, and yeah. I mean, the social, social media, it seems to me, brings at least two levels of concern that don't exist in these Maybe areas where, we, yeah, where we're just squandering our time. I and mean, the worst case scenario is for an, you know, an individual siloed app or a website, you're just misusing your time and you'll yeah. regret it. But with social media, you are, this again connects to the fake news problem, you are very likely consuming misinformation that is manipulating you and this is bad not only for you but for society. And then you have this other level of, of your sense of self-worth yeah. being leveraged yeah. and in many cases destroyed and at an early age in ways that can be difficult to recover from by your interaction with friends and strangers in this space. Well, this is, this is where it relates to cults, right? Because cults partially manipulate you by orchestrating your sense in the social realm as well, right? Mm. Just like we were talking about Facebook ranking before, you could imagine a uh, jealousy rank, which is a ranking of newsfeed or Instagram that is optimized to make you the most jealous of everybody else or to feel the worst about yourself. Like that, that's, yeah. that's just a mode you could create. And, um, you know, I've, I've written about this, but you know, there's these, we have not just this list of individual cognitive biases, but we also have these social psychological biases. We really care about others' approval. So think of the moment where people post a new profile photo on Facebook. That's a moment where you're putting your whole sort of self-identity on the line. It's yeah. like my new photo. And so knowing this, I don't know if Facebook does this, but knowing this, oh my God, I would just say, I, this is an easiest opportunity to exploit people's sense of self-worth. So what I'm going to do is time delay how often I notify you of new likes. So over the period of three days, I'll keep showing it to other friends strategically over the course of three days, because then they'll start to like it more. And then I, caring about who's seen my, who's liked my new thing, uh, will we'll fall back into the, 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 the loop, right? So that's, that would be one way of hijacking people's attention again by mm -hmm. controlling their sense of identity. Uh, and Snaps, I don't know how much you follow Snaps chat, but uh, they have this feature called Snapstreaks, which is, I think, really manipulative. Do you know Snapstreaks? No, I, I never use Snapchat, so. Um, I mean, I, I don't either, but they added this thing called Snapstreaks, which shows you the number of days in a row that you have sent a message with someone. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, people who oh, use so it you, actively. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like it's like a, in the meditation app, you'd have the same. Right, but no, but I, I see the implications here where if, if you, well, there, there's, there, there's a reciprocity issue when you're exactly. communicating with someone. And, yeah. the, and the thing is that as Snapchat, you can manufacture reciprocity. You can know that that person over there is vulnerable to needing to reciprocate. Mm. Like, let's, let's say you have a person that you know their psychology specifically, they have to say uh, thank you back when someone says thank you to them. So you can just make sure that they see thank yous everywhere. Or Facebook, frankly, does this with the happy birthday thing. 
Right. They could sort of orchestrate someone into saying happy birthday to someone else. So the other person has to come back into Facebook and respond. And this is actually how LinkedIn works, where they say, we're going to suggest to Sam that right after our conversation that he adds Tristan on LinkedIn, because I'll know that I'll feel compelled to come back to you. And, and again, this is like a cult. It's like, you don't just control these individual biases. You, you can orchestrate people's whole social psychological biases without them knowing it. So we've spoken a little bit about what designers of the city should do, what, whether they will do any of these things, and over what time frame, that's certainly an open question. What should our listeners do in light of the fact that nothing will get done today to help them marshal their attention in a way that they will not regret? Well, um, I mean, there are I try not to get into the productivity hacks game. I mean, I do know a lot about that that space. I think the biggest thing is to change culturally the perception that technology is neutral. When we use, just when we're using this stuff, we have to recognize that there's a thousand engineers on the other side of the screen whose goal in designing the way I'm looking at this screen now was not to empower me most to make the life choices of my time that I want to make, but empowering me to spend time on the screen. Knowing that you will be able to spot some of these different techniques more easily because you can start to become aware of, you know, what, what actually is, am I being steered to do in any given moment? Now, that's actually not a pleasant way to live. Um, and, and that's why I think we, we actually need a new conversation about persuasion because we don't want to sit there in a world that's increasingly going to get better and better at persuading us and then be forced to sort of notice all these steering mechanisms in our lives and feel taxed and vigilant all the time. An ideal would be to be able to only deploy conscious energy when for the for the places for the for the choices that matter and to not be forced to kind of steer away from the from the donuts. You can imagine an adversarial persuader who puts donuts in your uh, you know right next to your bedside table right when you wake up. And that would you know you could say well what's the big deal there because you could simply choose to avoid not to you know, choose it. But of course, we just know that would be disempowering, and we have to, we have to expend some amount of conscious energy. This is the Roy Baumeister stuff uh, on willpower. There's some amount of energy that it takes to resist this stuff when it shows up. Yeah. And, and we don't want a world where, as we're navigating to Facebook or something else, we have to constantly say, okay, shit, they're going to you know, try to get me to do something else than this one task I wanted to do of looking up a contact or uh, finding out where that event is tonight. And so the whole idea behind like a sort of a time well spent world is that things are designed so that they're aligned with you. I mean, the biggest thing about ethical persuasion is that the goals of the persuader are aligned with the goals of the persuadee. Persuasion is, in most cases, neutral. I mean, we want to be persuaded to do things which we will feel constituted time well spent, right? Mm -hmm. So if there are 10 things on the menu, which I really want to get done, want to immerse myself in, there's no possibility that I will regret doing any of them. Mm -hmm. And two of them are readily captivating, which is to say that there's basically no friction in me that's impeding my paying attention to those things. But the other eight are, on some level, a matter of my eating my vegetables as opposed to the ice cream. I want to be persuaded to do those things. Right. Right. So we're not trying to get rid of persuasion. We just, we want some wisdom in the system. Yep. We want to be able to tell the system what it should be persuading us to do. Right. And it, let's imagine if we're playing the AI game here and we're trying to just imagine that we're training the AI to be hyper-intelligent persuaders. Let's imagine you even give the AI an encyclopedia of every magician cult technique that in the book. So it's, it's literally we have an AI that can persuade you to do anything. Thought experiment. That sounds, we then we really care about what does it mean for that AI to persuade you ethically or for the good? Right. And to do that, it could say, well, look, it's causing, it's persuading you to click on this thing and you seem to keep clicking on it. So you keep reinforcing it. That must be good. But clearly there is still something missing in that signal that the clicks weren't enough. Yeah. And so it has to be, I mean, in the AI, the AI community, they call this the human in the loop uh, computing where they keep the human in the loop of, uh, say, the automatically self-driving car or something like that. This is essentially a reflective self in the loop kind of persuasion. I care, just like I said with the, the phone example, it cares about what is time well spent for you in the morning. And it reflects that back to you and says, how is this going? And it only does that for the things that are meaningfully important in your life that it actually matters to do that reflection. Mm -hmm. But part of ethical persuasion, I think, is, is actually caring and, and helping the other person reflect on whether they're getting kind of what they, what they came for. 
It's interesting, though, that there is a disconnection between what people will say they want and what they actually want that drives through all of this. And so your, your analogy to self-driving cars reminded me of this fact that if you ask people, if you're driving down the street and you're going to hit a group of school children or you can drive off a cliff, speaking generically, they think the car should probably drive off a cliff, but nobody wants to be in that car. People will have to get better at choosing from the menu, yeah. even in their most reflective moments. Well, people have to have values. I mean, yeah. per your point earlier about, I think, you know, children, I think that the dangerous thing, and it's happened with consumerism, is where their values, the business's values, became our values. Which is successful advertising. That is successful advertising. Yeah. They generated, now you desire or want the thing that they got you to want. Right. Now, again, what's so bad about that if on reflection you feel happy about that? That's one thing, but there's still another thing, which is when you realize that someone manipulated you into doing that, into wanting that, and you weren't even aware that that was happening, people sometimes have a different point of view about whether or not they feel good about that. And this mm. is the cult thing, right? Yeah. This is, I was manipulated into an experience that then made me more free on the other end. And I feel really good about that. But then on retrospect, I feel like, oh, I had no, they were manipulating me that entire time. Yeah, and well, suddenly people have a different, and in culty programming, showing people how they were manipulated uh, is one of the most powerful ways to help people uh, get out of the programming that they were. Well, I guess it, it, on some level, transparency of intention is crucial there insofar as the relationship with other people is important. So if someone's trying to get you to do something and you understand their motives, yeah. right? That you understand, one, that they're actually trying to get you to do something, and two, you know why, and your why is actually their why, well, then, then that's, there's no problem, right? right. Then, then it's a completely consensual situation. You're not going to feel manipulated, but you could feel pressured. You could feel, you could feel a lot of things. You, know, you could have a, a very hard-charging performance coach who is trying to get you to change, and it could be uncomfortable, but... Right, they could yell at you, they, yeah. could, they could know that you're traumatized by this particular form of confrontation, so they use that form of confrontation that might be harsh, Right, but, but you're happy about it on the other end. Yeah, and you, but, and you understand what you signed up for. Right. What gets interesting and seemingly demeaning when there's this mismatch between what you think is going on and what is actually going on in the other person's head. Not, and it does matter if it's personalized. If it's just an algorithm... Right. That, in fact, is a black box that no one understands, but it's just designed to maximize clicks in the universe. That's one thing. But if you have people who are, you know, twirling their mustaches... Well, how much have you followed, like, the Cambridge Analytica-type stories about political advertising and automated political advertising? A little bit, just in the, you know, what's happened in this with the Trump phenomenon. Yeah, so there's a lot of controversy over whether Cambridge Analytica specifically was so effective as it was claimed to be in the election. But it really doesn't matter. Uh, what we're talking about is that there, there are metaphorically um, things that are very good at using personalized persuasive targeting to persuade you about, I mean, the famous example in their deck was if you're the kind of person who values tradition and authority and kind of old school values and uh, you're male, it would show you a, a sunset picture of a, of a grandfather and a boy with a gun saying, you know, this is just like the homeland when we used to go hunting or something mm -hmm. like that. And then if it's uh, instead, you know, uh, sort of a libertarian, um, you know, woman uh, in Kansas or something like that who really values the Second Amendment, they'll put a thing of a Obama uh, trying to grab your gun or something like that. And knowing what I would know about your specific psychology, I could persuade you towards a particular attitude or belief. And if you just imagine that that exists and it's very effective and that Facebook 100 million times a second runs this auction, it's got Sam's eyeball, and it's basically saying, who's going to pay me the most to persuade Sam? And it doesn't care whether your intention is nefarious or you uh, want to help Sam or you're trying to sell him some shoes. It can't make this distinction. We don't have language in English for uh, these subtle versions, these subtle distinctions in persuasion. What is the difference between manipulate, coerce, seduce, drive, steer? Uh, there is no vocabulary. And so this is what I actually think is, is most important. And I think your work is so related to this is how do we come up with the language of persuasion 
where when we have an increasingly persuasive world, it's one that we actually want to live in. And the biggest thing is that the goals of the persuader are aligned with the goals of the persuadee. And that there's transparency, like you said. Now, what was this recent decision in Congress to let internet service providers sell all of our browsing history? And this is something that just happened, I think, last week. Uh, just like last 24 hours, I think. Yeah, and, I, and yeah. I, I haven't followed... I mean, I'm sure there's going to be pushback against this. I don't know if this is a fait accompli yet or not, but I can't imagine more than 10% of the American population would want this to be true. Politically, I, it's hard to see how this is, this is something that is I'd easily accomplished. Have, I'd only have to imagine that the telephone companies had funded politicians who, you know, yeah, had, but had signed off on this. I mean, there's nothing about this we're that is We're going to freak about... out completely over this and, and yeah. it'll get rolled back. Yeah. I mean, I would hope so. I mean, as an example, I mean, people don't make the connection. If you try to sell someone, I'm talking about persuasion. If you invoke the frame of, oh, they have your data, they have your data, the data, the data, the data, big data, that doesn't mean anything to someone. I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing that's sort of alarming about that. Uh, some people hold on to it. They don't like the idea of their privacy being taken away. But data is kind of boring. But when you realize that your data could be used to figure out exactly what persuades you, like let's say with this specific act in Congress, I now know which websites you visit. So I know which kind of news consumer you are, which means I know something about what persuades you. Knowing that, I can probably cross-pollinate that information with something else, voter data or something else, and I would know exactly how to persuade you for the next election. And Facebook, because it can't make a distinction between who wants to persuade you for good and who's trying to, say, manipulate you in an election, and again, we don't have language for what kind of persuasion we would want to enable or allow. It has to simply, 100 million times a second, let whoever pays them the most put whatever message they want in front of you. And I think this really happened in the election, and people, we haven't had a conversation about it. It's an existential threat to the belief systems that we have. And I think we haven't ever named or protected this other thing, which is what, what is the kind of functioning of a mind or a critical mind or a sovereign mind, if there is such a thing because of these deep questions about free will that we would want to protect? Are there certain ground rules or a Geneva Convention around persuasion that we would want to uh, say hands off for this, for this kind? I think the, the master value here, first it comes back to the thing you said, which is you have to have values. Yep. And one thing you have to value is the truth and right. the fact-fiction distinction, right? Or the fact-fantasy distinction. And if that is somehow up for grabs, if persuasion slips the rails of a reality-based conversation, right. as it does in politics and as it does in advertising, as it does when people are just, they want to manufacture and spread mere sentiment, not only do people not care about what's true, the not caring is, there's kind of an orgy of not caring. They're celebrating their immunity to truth. I mean, they, they will claim fake news about news that they don't like. Yeah. They'll claim something's a lie when they, they're not actually even claiming it's a lie. They're, 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 they call it a lie so as to disparage it, but... Yeah. Well, they're persuading. That's the thing is, that at the end of the day, all of these statements, which we're calling free speech, are actually forms of persuasion. By calling it a lie, they are invoking a persuasive transaction which has an impact yeah. on people of different... Right predispositions. Yeah. And, and that's the conversation we're not having, that people are persuadable. We don't even think of ourselves that way. And especially, you know, people who are, who are uh, whatever, educated, believe that they're not, they're somehow part, of, they're exceptional from this, this group. They're, they're not part of this, this system of persuasion. They could never be persuaded. But we actually have to live in a world where we realize that we're all persuaded. I mean, here's a good example. Um, you know, there was a science uh, post article uh, that said 70% of articles on Facebook are shared before even reading the article. Now, the thing about this article was that when you click on it, the first paragraph was real text. Right. The rest of the, the article rest was gibberish. Was gibberish. <laughs> or Latin. And the yeah. test was how many people shared this thing. Right. And a lot of people shared it, and it was a joke. But the point being, the reason I invoke this example, is it's something that actually all of us have a predisposition to believe. Because yeah. all of us, and this, this speaks to whatever your predisposition beliefs are, you can layer in whatever you want on top of that. And that's how our mind works. It's just this kind of, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the question is, who set in the first layer of hammers that's then confirming the next layer right. of things? And so, you know, as a universal 
everyone would be persuaded by an example like that. We, we haven't acknowledged that there's a way that our mind works. If you repeat something to someone multiple times, you're embedding that in their mind, whether they want it to be there or not. So if I go bump, bump, ba bump, bump, right? I mean, yeah, you fill in the, your, the beats, your mind yeah. did that. I mean, yeah. the magic is all about these automatic processes, but we don't walk around saying, yeah, I've got this massive, like a brain, you know, uh, patient, you know, with a big hole waiting for anyone just to go in there and just pop something in. Yeah. That's actually how we are. And we, instead of talking about that, we just talk about free speech instead of saying there's actually some people who are tossing some pretty dangerous stuff in those holes because they know the rules better than the other guys. And unfortunately, some of the rules are inconvenient for aligning your beliefs with reality. So for instance, there's the, the backfire effect that has been much publicized where you, you give people evidence against yep. their cherished opinion yep. and it only redoubles their conviction no matter what the quality of the evidence you give. Even more troublesome, there's a truth bias where even if you have only been told a story in the context of hearing that it's false, you will tend to have a false memory of its being true. This is the, I mean, this is Elizabeth Loftus's research, and it's also the yeah. same as the 70% Facebook thing, right? Like if I just repeated that 10 times, it actually is true that people share more articles than, than uh, before reading than after reading. Right. But that number, if I just repeated that 10 times, what I've done is made salient to your subconscious and to your memory. That is the thing you're going to remember later when someone says, Oh, yeah, it's like it's like 70% or something. Yeah, but and again, even if you've even only if you told it in the context of it being this false. is not true. Right. Yeah, it's widely believed, but this is not true. It's that, sort of remem yeah. a memory version of don't think of an elephant. Yeah. It's just the same thing. It causes you to think of an elephant. Yeah. There are many things that are bugs and not features about the human mind, and we need to have a systems-level view of how to optimize ourselves. And to do that, we would want to have almost like a map of here are all the ways people get hijacked. Yeah. Starting there, starting with the fact that people can be habit formed into an addiction with the slot machine, starting with the idea that you can manipulate people's social approval or social comparison, starting with all of these things that you can do, what then would we want the choice to architecture and environment or the social environment to look like if we can have free control to, to place people and who and what and when? How would we want to be orchestrating in an ethical way? Because this is actually what's happening. I mean, like the, the Facebook newsfeed, the people talk about runaway AI, the, the Facebook newsfeed is already a runaway AI. To its eyes, it's just maximizing the clicks and engagement. It never knew it was invisibly maximizing outrage yeah. or polarization or fake news. And so the, the humans don't even have control over this stuff. And it is persuading us because we don't have a language for what we want and what we don't want. And we can't wait to correct it at the other end. I think a lot of the problems right now is people, I talked to some people in the industry who said, you know, well, it's, you know, you're probably right, but we're going to correct this later. Society will kind of flip around or self-correct. Mm. But, you know, the fake news thing, for example, everybody scrambled on that after the elections. Oh, yeah. We, so we need a kind of real-time philosopher. And we still don't know how, obviously, we know that if it had any effect, I mean, given how close the election was, any effect was too much and, right. and determined the outcome. But we still don't know the, the extent to which we were manipulated by bots and propaganda and we have no idea and that's yeah. why i think you know i know ann applebaum was just on the show and um you know that's what propaganda is the same thing right you just compromise and all of these strategies all these disinformation campaigns confusion overwhelming people and in information these are all nameable playbook yeah. persuasion strategies and, and you can find the people who consciously do these things yeah it exists yeah. i went and i for the tech side i went to school with all of them and and there's a whole industry that does it. there's conferences there's books there's one next week in san francisco i mean there's this whole dark art form but because mm. there is no language for it and because we walk around with this illusion that we're not persuaded or right. that some of us are some of us are not persuaded even i mean i sometimes feel like you know if you imagine you know you could beam enlightenment down into an ant and an ant could like open its eyes and see all of the ways that its ant architecture worked. You literally gave it a full download of the matrix and mm. showed it, here's all the ways its pheromones are manipulated, and here's all the ways that it walks, and here's all the social rules. And at the end of the day, when it opens its eyes and it knows all this stuff, the next wave of pheromones comes along, it's still inside of an ant body. It and still it's wants gonna, to be an ant. It still yeah. wants to be an ant. Yeah. You know, we all are trapped inside of our architecture, and we just don't have a name for this architecture that we're inside of. And I think it's actually the existential problem because when you talk about runaway AI and AI getting better and better and better, what it is is it's something that is greater in control or power or intelligence than the people who made it. 
And persuasion is kind of like that. There's something that can subvert my architecture. I can't close the holes that are in my brain. They're just yeah. there for someone to exploit. The best I can do is become aware of some of them. But then I don't want to walk around in the world being just vigilant all the time of all the ways my buttons are being pressed. Again, this has always been true to some degree, but it's getting more and more true. You can decide to change your architecture insofar as it's changeable or, or manipulate it, have the system manipulate it, live in the, a part of the city that will manipulate it differently and, and so, in and, ways that you won't regret. And so that's a relevant form of agency is does someone have the ability to move to the part of the city where they're not exposed to the manipulation they don't want to be exposed to. Right. That's one form of agency. The thing I'm so interested by with our phones and, and with Facebook is that these are things that people live by. I mean, 50% of the U.S. population, the Pew Internet and Internet Study, basically the number one news source for 50% of the U.S. was Facebook. Hmm. So this is something that people are checking every day and runs their beliefs about the world. It's so invisible the way that, you know, when you just take a breath and look at where we are near a beach, like... You know, that's a very different phenomenological experience than the beliefs that get put inside me by looking at Facebook. Mm. And, you know, we, we just don't talk about this. I think the issue that concerns you, and this, you know, perhaps paradoxically, this is my concern as well, even though I think the notion of free will makes no sense. But there, there's a loss of agency. There's a loss of control over our lives. There's a loss of an ability to get what we want out of a human life that we're both worried about. And, and, you know, this is, I've talked about this in, in other podcasts, and I've written about this. It will be a seeming paradox to listeners who haven't followed me down that rabbit hole, but you don't need to believe in free will to worry about a loss of control or a loss of agency or a loss of getting what you want out of life. And I don't know what your views on free will are, but I... I mean, I've, I've studied the Libet experiments and the Illusion of Conscious Will book by... Wagner, Wagner yeah. and this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that there is an illusion there, but I think per Dennett's comments on your podcast that there are relevant degrees of freedom that you can right. take away. Yeah. And what to me is so concerning about persuasion, if you actually really trust that persuasion is real, that, that you can be persuaded, that, you know, there's even this stuff on um, people named Larry are statistically more likely to become lawyers. People named uh, 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 Dennis are statistically more likely to become dentists and people are more likely to like faces that look like their own. You could imagine mm. a future version of an election where I can manufacture a candidate whose name and appearance resonate with the things that are truest for you, that it could just actually feel as meaningful or as, as, as real as, as something else. And we, we didn't talk about, you know, for example, the, the persuasiveness of these false video generation things now, where you can actually generate live video of a celebrity talking and saying yeah. anything, along with the new audio version of that, where you can actually, with 20 minutes of someone's voice, uh, generate them saying anything. Yeah, well, this is, this is something I, I've commented on briefly in a, in a joking way, but this worries me because you, you can just you take a two-minute sample of this podcast and then you can make me say anything in a way that will be undetectable. There actually is a video of you saying this. Do you know this? There's yeah. a video of... of uh, so, so it's not... A, it's a YouTube video where someone took your podcast and has you saying really interesting gibberish. I'll have to send it to you. Well, that, well someone just did, I, I did a podcast with, uh, two podcasts with the psychologist Jordan Peterson, and, and these were famously frustrating for, for most listeners. And so someone has chopped those up, getting us to say just a string of outrageous things. Yeah. But the edits are obvious enough that it's just pure comedy, and I totally support this. But the right. moment the, this editing gets good enough so as to misrepresent me in a way that's undetectable, then it becomes a real concern. And I, I don't know. I'm sure there must be some technological fix for this in the end. Whether it's Well, and it's going to be a cat and mouse game arms race, right? Where the guys who are good at simulating your voice and video will have to be matched by an AI that can detect and catch those things because it'll be outside of human awareness. Right. And this is what's so scary is that this is just an example of something can overload the architecture, the human architecture, your ability to discern that this is real evidence. Not yeah. that that already hasn't existed, as we both know. But, but when you really take that all the way, the idea that persuasion can undermine your beliefs, your attitudes, your behavior, um, even some sense of identity, you can, you can shift all that. Then the way where we put authority after the Enlightenment, which was to put authority in the individual feelings and thoughts and beliefs of people to, for elections, for markets, both of these things are now subject to question. Because huh. if you can persuade someone to have 
different beliefs about a product or how much it'll benefit them or how much it'll make them happy, and it doesn't actually do any of those things, or persuade someone of a candidate, you know, with with all these techniques, and they don't do any of those things. Mm. This is really, really dangerous, and it undermines where we've put authority in in our current age. Yeah. And you know, this this forces opens up some very big questions about what is the kind of persuasive world we want to live in because it's only going to get better. Yeah, and and it cuts directly against the normative value of democracy or putting anything to the will of a majority because. If the majority is just an ocean of attention that can be diverted and manipulated now more or less at a whim and reliably so as to guarantee a given outcome, well then not only is it not a good thing to have a democracy, it becomes just another cog in the machine of totalitarian control. Exactly. And wouldn't we want to know, given that this exists, wouldn't we want to sort of walk around every day with that understanding and now build the world and our institutions and our technology in service of that view of our nature meaning Mm -hmm. wouldn't we we wouldn't want to forget all that and go back to business as usual whether it's with technology that pretends we don't have biases that are slot machine type things that can get manipulated we want to say okay that's a real thing about how people work and we want to fix that so that we don't manipulate people that way and here's some ways that people are getting manipulated in elections and here's people being manipulated in marketing and we do do that with things like the fda checking the claims of a of a, someone saying that uh, marketing certain claims of benefits right we, we actually say oh we want to check to make sure that's true and and essentially we have when this race to the bottom arms race for persuasion we we're going to now need some other more nuanced more philosophical set of checks on what kind of persuasion we want to live in the world and what when we don't so much of this for me comes back to honesty and the consequences of lying and I mean, what what terrifies me about the current political environment is that not only is there no penalty for being caught lying, it becomes a almost a point of pride. It's like you, like you have enough power and a sufficient lack of concern by how you're perceived by your detractors that to be caught lying to the world, everyone knows I'm talking about Trump and his supporters <laughs> here, but it's almost a singular example where his brand is not harmed by him obviously lying to everyone in a moment where he's believed by no one. It's not a successful lie. It's not a lie which was crafted so as to be believed even by the people who support him. It's just this naked declaration of, I'm not bound by your norms of discourse. I am so successfully persuading... He's persuaded the epistemological architecture. Yeah. People don't... That that doesn't even exist or matter anymore. Right. The fact falsity distinction doesn't matter to me or my supporters, and we're winning. That's the structure of the communication. It's amazing to me. We have to get back to a place where being out of harmony with what is demonstrably true pays a penalty. Right. And the value we have to all embrace is we have to care to be in register to the truth, and we have to care that, especially we have to care when people who are in power, whose decisions affect the lives of millions, we have to care when they're in register or out of register with what's true. And we have to care if they care, right? Right. All of that has to be right. of a piece. You know, there, there was something, I've been talking to a professor at Stanford about propaganda, and, and actually we're, we're, th- we're in the process of starting a group that would help define this sort of code of ethics for persuasion. Uh, it would be great to talk to you about it, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things we were talking about is there used to be something called the democratic personality or the democratic psychology in the 1940s, meaning that there was a kind of way that minds or a psychological mind would, would ought to work for it to function as intended in a democracy. It would have to fulfill certain basic requirements. And I think this is something that you're really interested in, you know, openness to updating, to evidence. Yeah being able to dispassionately say, what would convince me otherwise? Right, right. right. That's, that's a move, a cognitive move, that someone would have to be able to make yeah, it's to like participate it, it's, in it's, democracy. It's basically like a, a Cirque du Soleil level move right. for, in the current yeah. environment, but it's the most basic feature of human sanity. You would think to, so. To be able to say, how would the world have to be different so that I would believe differently right. than I do? And then what's weird is that there's going to be, and there's this whole list of these kinds of moves that would be part of the democratic psychology. And there's 
also a kind of developmental angle to this too, where some de developmentally, some minds are going to be capable mm. of doing that move and others will not. For example, I mean, like if you ask a child before age four, before it has theory of mind to do a thing that requires theory of mind, it can't do it. There's no way to explain it or convince it. They just can't do that. And there's going to be some moves like asking someone to simulate a thought experiment. Some people, I'm sure you've had mm -hmm. conversations with them, actually can't do that move. They get caught up in uh, the concrete details of what right. you've asked them. Right. That, yeah. that could never happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, I discovered that Noam Chomsky appears to be one of these people. <laughs> but unlike many other things where people, where people's deficits are obvious and they will acknowledge, even the holder of the deficit will acknowledge the consequences of not being able to do certain things. Athletics is the perfect case where people not only have a fairly good estimation of their own athletic ability, but they will recognize that they're nothing like the best in the world. I mean, you don't have, you don't have people walking around imagining that they're as good as anyone on earth at golf or tennis or basketball or anything, right? Unless they are pretty close to being as Unless good as anyone you're on earth. President Trump, but I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. He has actually said some <laughs> insane things, even in that domain. But in intellectual and moral space, right. you tend to get confusion here, where it's people assume that they are reliably doing what even the best of the experts are doing. And this is kind of related to the, I, no one believes that they can be persuaded or the Dunning-Kruger effect, right. even some variation of that. Everyone more, what is it, like 90% of people think they're better than average drivers, yeah, which is impossible. Yeah. But, and also this, this does, I think the stat that reveals that this moves into a fairly high level of, of education, at least, is I think it is 95% of college professors think that they're above average professors. Right. I'm sure this is about 30 years old. That It shows how universal this is. That's the thing about this. I mean, I've been calling it persuasion this whole time or the architecture, but it's really, it's just the universal ways that we'll, let's say, overestimate something yeah. or that we would assume that we have the moral or cognitive moves that everybody else has. There's got to be some curriculum where you would not only expose these problems in yourself, but you could address them. Some part of the educational system mm -hmm. for everyone should be revealing these glitches in human psychology and addressing them in a way that improves people. I guess you, you will get to some interesting liminal case where some mismatch between your view of yourself and the true statistical view of you is actually beneficial to you, so that perhaps believing that you're a little better than you are right. actually makes you a little better right. in, in certain cases. Like you're persuading yourself in an ethical way because it leads to you reaching for the thing that you may not have yet. And I, or I guess it's just, there may be cases where too much information about yourself psychometrically in, in, in some way or another could be a bad thing. And certainly knowing that other people have this information about you could be a bad thing. You know, just pedagogically, people who know much more about education than I do would uh, need to vet this. But it, it just seems like you want to collapse that distance as much as is good for us, the distance between private delusion mm -hmm. and right. belief that's uncoupled to reality and reality itself. Right. That might be part of the sort of, we've been calling it the democratic psychology, but a reasonably functioning mind would not have such wide gaps between yeah. what they believe to be true and what, what actually is. And they would care to, again, the, you have this, this master value of human flourishing, not for lack of a better word, yeah. but you would care to collapse that distance to the degree that you lead a life worth living. And again, knowing that your estimation of what is good is one of these things that's constantly open for refinement and dialogue. Right. Someone could come into this room right now and convince us, if we have these sorts of minds that we're advertising, that many of the things we value are not the things we should value. There right. are better things to value. Right. And, you know, I, I certainly believe that I'm open to argument on almost almost anything uh, I value. That's a conversation I want to have. What we what worries me is that so much of our public life, certainly all of our politics, seems to be optimized for not allowing conversation to proceed in a direction of changing minds in, right. in anything like a systematic way that produces good outcomes. Right. That gets people to converge. People start with at some distance from this, you know, the same value, the same, even just the same fact space. I mean, just 
yeah. climate change. You know, let's right. talk about climate change and have a rewarding conversation, right? I mean, that, that, we can't even talk about right. the value of facts or the value of expert opinion. And it's just completely destabilizing from a political point of view. And, and I think also linking it with the technology conversation, where are these kinds of conversations that we're talking about? The style of openness to evidence and discourse that leads to a converging of values and a negotiation of what actually matters for that value. Where is that happening? On, say, Twitter or Facebook or mm -hmm. whatever people are having conversations. Where is that not happening? Let's imagine that Facebook being, I just go back to it so often, I know you don't use it as mm -hmm. much, but that being the place where people are having these conversations would say, where could we help we're, like, what are the plate? We could build a classifier that, that notices when people are having these kinds of open, vulnerable, reconciliatory, values based conversations. Mm. Dispassionate, like, build a dispassionate uh, openness to truth identifier and just find those key phrases when people do that move. You could imagine them making a tweak and suddenly those things are everywhere. You know, that that actually is the thing that gets rewarded in the, the current thing, just says wherever people are talking a lot to each other. You could have a an additional button in addition to a like or a, I don't even know what the buttons are on Facebook, but you could have <laughs> something, something that, that indicated that your mind was changed by yeah, I love that. something, yeah. you know, by a tweet, by the article that was linked or by, right. by the comment. Well, this is the thing people miss is that there's this whole like, like landscape of opportunities, yeah. meaning that's one example of so many. The face that people mistake these these services as being static and fixed. Twitter is just Twitter. Facebook's just Facebook. They're just tools. Right. How else could it be? How yeah. else could it be? Yeah. There is a just insane set of positive possibilities. If that if the people that were at those companies had say hired a bunch of nonviolent communicators and philosophers and saying what yeah. are the what actually constitutes the conversations we want? Like Quora, you know, the website has a thanks button. So when someone uh, provides an answer you like, you say, thanks. It's a different gesture than a like and a comment and a share. I mean, mm -hmm. another gesture might be, you know, when you post something controversial, it could be organize a dinner to talk about it. Right. You know, it could be right there, organize a dinner, a super lightweight thing, and people just add themselves right there underneath the story. And they can just, you're having dinner on Tuesday. You mm -hmm. know, and the question would become, again, if we're steering people's ch choices about their time, we don't just have to use the time now. We're, we can be scheduling all sorts of things in the immediate versus in the longer term. And all of these choice architectures are possible in digital media if the people making them ask the deepest question, which is what would be the time well spent for this set of people talking about this thing, mm. right? I mean, it, it is just astonishing how different it could be yeah. if we were thinking differently. Well, I think, I think there are two parts to engineering that change. One is to expose how it is and why it's that way to make us less comfortable with the status quo. And, and, and you got it at that earlier on when you were talking about, if you put the frame around this, this is your day on outrage, right? You know, this is, this <laughs> yeah, is the, the outrage, tab. Outrage tab, yeah. Yeah, that reveals that people are, are selecting for a variable that they weren't, maybe had never considered. And, and maybe, maybe it took some years for even the engineers to realize that clicks meant outrage rather than something else, right? Des right. Rather than desire satisfied, right? Right. But then there's just envisioning the changes that we could make that would open up right. space, you know, intellectual space, social space in ways that no one has thought of yet. And then that's both a design question, because someone has to be designing and putting those verbs, those actions, those other choices on the menu, on the screen. And it's also the metrics question. I mean, this whole thing about what is the AI maximizing, the paperclips thing. Right. You know, it maximizes paperclips until it turns the earth inside out. It's like, well, the Facebook thing is currently maximizing clicks and attention until it turns the world into outrage, right? And, and so with, with the AI, the question is, what else should that AI be aware of? What other values should it be listening for or tuning into so it's not just maximizing the one thing? And this is what, you know, Yukowski and all these other guys are, are, are talking about when they say there's this, this, how do we build in these other values, these comprehensive value complex value uh, mixture models of saying, well, this is how much this matters for conversation. How much does uh, long comments matter? How much does putting evidence in there matter? How much does the head nodding or the you, you change my mind button, you know, feature matter? Right. Um, and each of those are philosophical conversations. Um, and I do want to say that, you know, one of the structural problems right now is that if you view this attention economy as this city that these three or four companies basically built, um, 
the, that city isn't, um, we don't have public representation in that city. You know, when we see a pothole or we see this, this sort of a, an intersection where people are getting in a car crash all the time, it's like the equivalent of that in Facebook is people are getting into sort of weaponized arguments all the time. And we don't have a way of saying... That's not even acknowledged to be a car crash. It's not that's even acknowledged just, to be a car crash. That's just more action. Well, that's yeah, just more over time a neutral platform. Yeah. People will do what they do. Yeah. It's, no, that's not true. It's that the size of the text box matters, whether the three actions being like, comment, or share versus something else versus organize yeah. the dinner conversation, that one-click button to get together. Yeah. I mean, there, There's also even confusion over what it means to like something or to forward something. I mean, people have forwarded or liked things that they actually hated Right. Just because they, that's the way you spread this thing you hate that you want everyone to see. Well, that's actually literally what outrage is, right? You share it and then comment and say, I can't, can you believe what yeah. they said, right? I mean, that's, that's, what, that's why that outrage thing is so powerful. I remember I, there was a, an adorable moment of confusion. I was in a debate with this sometimes comic, full-time Muslim apologist, uh, Dean Obadala. I think we were, on, we were on CNN together, and he had posted the video on his YouTube page. And the video got a ton of likes. And he thought, because it was getting, so he actually said this on, I think this is on Twitter, because we, the, the, the aftermath of this was somewhat bloody. And he thought that the, the number of likes he was getting suggested that people thought he had won the debate, right? I mean, because we had, had disagreed, you know, viciously. Yep. And as far as I could tell, 99% of people who saw that video thought he had not acquitted himself well, but he actually... He defended himself on the basis of how many likes he was getting. It was right. just this. Well, and, this, and people can be confused in all sorts of ways around this because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of teenagers think that the number of likes that they get on a post is representative of how valuable they are. In fact, right. I don't know if you know this, but they, people actually, like, delete their post. Um, people will post a photo on Instagram. If it doesn't get enough likes, they'll actually take it down because they feel like their self-worth is, is threatened. That's how seriously these things have mediated people's values. Just like we talked about consumerism, their values became my values. Their representation system of the number of likes that I got became the way that I value myself. I've yeah. been infected. I am a robot. They've just drilled a hole in the back and they have got me. I now value myself based on that. And, mm. and, and this is why people, like to your point, I think need to see first that this is a deliberate in deliberate service of maximizing attention and engagement. It's not all built to help us. Well, let's change it. Let's do it. It's, we're working yeah. on it. No doubt there'll be more to talk about in the future because I'm barely using social media, apparently, and uh, I have spent about 15 minutes in virtual reality. <laughs> so um, you'll come back on the podcast when, when everything is much more Matrix-like than it is <laughs> at present. Look forward to it. Hopefully at this it's pace, better. that'll be in about six months. Yeah, right. cool. Know? Well, thank you, Tristan. Thanks for having me. Before we go, um, how can people find out more about you? Are you more on Twitter? Are you more uh, where? where um, are you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter uh, at Tristan Harris. Yeah. Is there any irony in pointing people to your Twitter page, given what we've just said? There is. Yeah. I feel always uncomfortable about how much I use these products. But the thing is, again, th there's incredible benefit to them as well. It's just a matter of can we align their design to be more aligned with uh, all these things that we care about. But yeah. yeah, Tristan Harris. Well, to be continued. Thanks, Sam. If you find these conversations valuable, there are many ways you can support this podcast. You can leave reviews on iTunes or anywhere else the show appears. You can tell your friends about it or link to it on social media. Or you can sponsor the podcast directly through my website. My support page has links to Patreon, where you can support the show on a per-episode basis. It also has Amazon affiliates links that you can bookmark. And then you'll be supporting the show whenever you shop at Amazon at no extra cost to you. All the resources you need to support the Waking Up podcast can be found at 